Hello everyone and welcome back for another lecture. Last week we talked about igneous rocks and their origin volcanically and magmatically. So this week we'll get into sedimentary rocks, their formative environments, as well as metamorphic rocks and how those come to be. First let us revisit the rock cycle diagram that we looked at last week. Recall that Sedimentary rocks are the result of first the creation of sediment via weathering and erosion of some other rock, whether that's igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, or other sedimentary rocks, and then the later compaction and cementation of those materials uh, until it becomes lithified or, in other words, solidified into a solid rock. Sedimentary rocks can then continue on in the rock cycle by either being altered by enough heat and pressure to metamorphose them, where they become metamorphic rocks, or they can be melted down back to their original magmatic uh, material and then cool and crystallize into igneous rocks. And we looked at this figure a little bit last week. As for this lecture, we'll be focusing uh, just on the portion pertaining to sediments and sedimentary rocks. So the general idea, again, was that, uh, that rocks are broken down into sediments at higher altitudes by a weathering and erosion that's usually involving wind or water, and then are carried by a gravity down to the lower topographic portions, usually ocean basins, rivers, or other water bodies where it'll then further be carried out, eventually landing in an ocean. And so we're going to look at some of these environmental uh, areas or depositional facies uh, as we get into the lecture here, and you guys will be investigating that in your uh, assignment this week. So we know what sedimentary rocks are, uh, generally speaking. We're at a point where we understand that they are broken down pieces of pre-existing rock or minerals that have been uh, smushed together and cemented together. However, note that this can also include biological matter, so uh, dead bacteria, dead plant matter, anything once living or carbon-based. And the way that we categorize sedimentary rocks and classify them depends on these main constituents. One type of sedimentary rock is detrital, also referred to as clastic. And these are rocks that are just made of other rock and mineral fragments. Then we have chemical rocks. These are produced by what we call precipitation. This is a uh, chemical reaction from solids from a liquid solution to a solid solution when we have an interaction between water uh, containing minerals and the rock and the minerals within that rock or sediment. And then we have organics, which are the, the rocks or sedimentary rocks primarily composed of organic or carbon-based material. Uh, there's usually other minerals contained within this, but if it's over 50% organic material, it's classified as an organic sedimentary rock. And these types, classifications, or primary compositions all tell us about how that rock came to be what was the formative or past environment of that rock. Um, one easy example of this would be that if you're looking at a fossil, that obviously tells you that um, there was once, usually you're looking at leaves of some sort or other plant life, or maybe some uh, small marine organisms. If you're seeing plant life, you're looking at something likely terrestrial, unless it's a coral, then you're looking at marine, uh, so on and so forth. You can make those uh, assumptions based on what you're seeing. And we also have several important resources housed by sedimentary rocks. This is a, a large portion of what geologists end up doing is uh, understanding the subsurface or sedimentary rocks specifically so that we can identify and capture these natural resources. Uh, coal used to be a big one, not so much anymore. That's more so a dying industry, but oil and natural gas would be our primary ones that we see within sedimentary rocks that really bring an economic uh, pull or push. These are usually found within limestones uh, and around shales and other marine type sedimentary deposits. 
A little more on detrital or clastic sedimentary rocks. This is the most common type of sedimentary rock, which makes sense because it's just broken parts of any pre-existing rock. And there's a lot more pre-existing rock around than the amount of groundwater or water that we would need to get a chemically uh, produced sedimentary rock. And there's a lot more rock or, or non-living earth material than there is living earth material that we would need to get an organic sedimentary rock. Mind you, with chemical sedimentary rocks, they do have a crystalline texture. If you look at the petrographic thin section to the left there, um, this may look similar to you as what we looked at in the igneous rocks when we were talking about crystalline textures. And this is because these two have crystals that grow out and interlock with each other. It's just that instead of growing in a cooling magma, they are precipitating out of a solution. That solution being groundwater, uh, fresh, other freshwater sources, uh, or marine water. And our organic sedimentary rocks are the result of usually a s relatively slow accumulation of remains of organisms, that being uh, bacteria, plants, animals, so on and so forth, even fungi in some instances. Now to understand sedimentary rocks, we have to first understand sediment. Sediments are categorized much as sedimentary rocks are. So we have uh, any loose solid particles originating either from the breakdown of other rocks, they're chemically precipitated, or um, resulting from the, the death of organisms or other uh, live material. These are classified specifically by their particle size or grain size. Those of you who have done any kind of digging work in your backyard here in Michigan and probably noticed that we have a wider range of sediments. So you may be digging through what feels like primarily sand for a little while and then all of a sudden there are a bunch of larger pebbles. Um, and this is indicative of our formative environment. All of that sediment comes from glacial melt which picks up a wide range of sediment uh, sizes. And if we take a look here on the right, we can see a grain size chart, and this helps us classify what sediment we're actually looking at or what size sediment a sedimentary rock is composed of. So we have clay at the bottom. This is our smallest, finest sediment. You cannot see the edges of the grain. It just looks like a blur. Silt, it's very, very fine, but you can sort of see where one grain ends and another one begins. Fine sand, step above that, medium and coarse sand, and granules moving all the way up to pebbles, and above pebbles, of course, are boulders, and boulders are anything larger than 64 millimeters. Some sedimentologists will include cobbles as a step in between pebbles or granules and um, boulders. However, not everybody uses those. In the instance that we do use those, it would be 64 to 256 millimeter range. The terms weathering and erosion have already come up quite a few times for us. And these terms are often paired together because they, uh, the two, these two processes occur synchronously or concurrently. And the difference between the two is that weathering is the actual breakdown process of the pre-existing rock and erosion is the carrying away or movement of these fragments or particles and oftentimes weathering will continue through the erosion process. Hence the two often being paired together. And here's another view of what we considered earlier. This is uh, called a depositional model. There are a lot of different kinds of these but they all convey the general same message. So we have weathering and erosion and some uh, higher point uh, in altitude which will then be carried down eventually land in some sort of surface water body, um, usually a river, stream, maybe carried out to a delta, and eventually it will land in an ocean basin. And that's because ocean basins are our lowest topographic points. That's why the oceans are there. Erosion is also sometimes referred to as transportation. These are the same thing. These are just synonyms of one another. Um, preferably, we use the term erosion. And within this process of transportation, there are two other processes that will occur, and those are rounding and sorting. This is 
again, further weathering of the sediment as it is transported. And rounding just refers to the uh, spherosity of that sediment sample. If you think about a rock tumbler, what you're doing is, is spinning that around and around and it's rolling over other harder minerals that you're adding to the tumbler until it becomes smoother and rounder. And that happens naturally as well as sediments travel over uh, harder underlying sediment or rock itself via water or wind. The further a sediment is transported, the more round the sediment will be. The longer you leave your rocks in the rock tumbler, the smoother and more polished they will be. Furthermore, we can also refer to sorting, which happens as a result of transportation. This refers to the range in grain sizes, whether you have uh, a, a whole range of very small grains to very large grains, or mostly just medium grains. Um, we'll get into this a little bit more in a bit, but the more a sediment has been transported, the more well sorted it will be, and the rounder it will be. Generally speaking, the sediment size will also decrease with the increase in transport distance. However, that does depend on the energy level of the depositional environment. Higher energies can transport bigger grains. They weigh more, you need more energy to move them, and vice versa. Deposition is what occurs when a sediment is no longer being transported. This is the settling out and the coming of the rest of the transporta uh, transported material. They will eventually accumulate and settle down uh, into whatever area they're being deposited, whatever low-lying point at that point in time. This, uh, in some instances, is the ocean, but it doesn't always reach that far if conditions dry out or if, say, the wind changes direction. This means that we can have a variety of depositional environments, including but not limited to the deep sea floor that would be maximum transportation, carrying all the way from a high point to our lowest point, um, the beach somewhere in between that highest point and lowest point, and everything else in between those high and low points, desert dunes, river channels, lake bottoms, so on and so forth, wherever that train happens to stop. The terms preservation and liquefaction are also commonly used interchangeably. They do mean similar things, however, preservation generally refers to the preservation of some once living material or fossilization, and lithification is more generalized uh, for any process converting loose sediment into sedimentary rock. Lithification itself involves the processes of compaction and cementation. As we've gone over a couple times before, simply put, if we have some grains, there an overburdened pressure is applied, usually more sediment lying on top of it. That is the process of compaction by squeezing it out. This reduces the pore space, and then we have some kind of water flowing through it, whether it's surface water or groundwater. Uh, which will interact and create a chemical precipitant and cement the grains together, forming a sedimentary rock. We can take shale, for example. Shale is one rock that you'll be looking at in the next lab over sediment sedimentary rocks. Shale is formed by the deposition of mud in a river, lake, or most commonly deltaic environments, or in a delta that's the transitional space between a terrestrial area with freshwater rivers and, and lakes and the ocean. Uh, this is where we get a mix of saline and freshwater. And then as more and more of this sediment is deposited, the lower layers become heavily weighted, which compacts uh, and lithifies that rock by reducing the pore space, it's like squeezing the water out of a sponge, almost. Uh, and then the water containing those dissolved minerals flows through and cements it together, forming a shale. We often see this sort of layering present in shales where uh, 
kind of like when we looked at mycobiotite in our igneous labs, there were individual sheets that we could pry apart. Uh, it's harder to pry apart these sheets in shale and they don't form from an atomic structuring, but rather just the natural layering uh, of the deposited sediment. But same idea, um, this is called facility, uh, also sometimes referred to as lam laminae. When a sediment with a range of grain sizes is carried somewhere and transportation finally ceases, the deposition will involve the use settling out of sediments, meaning that they will uh, either drop from the air which is carrying them or settle down within a water column that is carrying them. And the things that come out first are the heaviest, largest material, and the lightest, smallest material will stay suspended in air or in water the longest. As a result, we end up with what is called graded bedding, meaning that as we see different periods of deposition, we will often see a fining upward trend, starting with coarse grains on the bottom and slowly uh, finer and finer grains moving upward. If we start to see coarse grains again, this means that we've entered a new depositional phase. Just like with the igneous rocks that we talked about last week, sedimentary textures also include clastic and crystalline. Reminder that clastic is anything where the grains are held together, but there is some amount of pore space, empty, either empty space, meaning that there's air filling those spaces, or water, depending on what stage of development and environment. And then we have crystalline, which is a direct interlocking and intergrowth of crystals. This happens with our precipitations um, from our chemical sedimentary rocks. To dive a little bit deeper into sorting, this is one of the main diagnostic, diagnostic properties that you will be using during lab to identify the sedimentary rocks that you're using. And this is because sorting is so indicative of the degree of transportation and the depositional environment. Um, Recall sorting is the relative degree of grain size variation or distribution within a rock. This ranges from very poorly sorted to very well sorted. In a very poorly sorted sample, grain sizes are incredibly different um, and unevenly sorted or distributed, ranging from very fine all the way to coarse. You can see an example of this on the far left of the upper figure. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have very well sorted, where all of the grains uh, appear to be about the same size. You don't see any distinct variation, and you can see an example of this on the far right of that same figure. And then there's everything in between. And you can see an example of that in the middle, as well as on the lower part, where we have both silt, our smaller grains, sand, medium grain, and clay, a very fine grain. That would be something that is uh, somewhere between poorly sorted and moderately sorted, depending on who you ask. Again, the more well sorted a sample is, or a, a rock is, the further it has traveled from the original source, the more transportation it has undergone. So let's go through a couple of examples together. Take the rock on the left-hand side. If we look at this, we can see um, some variation in color, some white grains, some pink grains, some gray to brown grains, but it's almost difficult to make out all of the edges. There's definitely different minerals in there, um, but it don't see necessarily any specific uh, ranges of size other than than one general, which would make this what? Well sorted. What about the example on the right hand side? We've got some larger uh, pebble type size grains and then some things filling in the gaps in between, which looks like maybe some some sand and some silt or clay type particles, a bit wider range here, which makes this poorly sorted. Here's that same diagram that we were looking at earlier with the depositional environments added into it. Uh, if we start on the left hand side, mind you that larger grains require more energy to move them, so 
areas or depositional environments where we would end up with our coarser gravels, larger, less well-rounded grains, are those which have a higher energy or higher flow, such as uh, rapids in a river shown in, in figure part A on the left. Those depositional environments which exhibit medium sand size type grains with moderate uh, sorting and moderate rounding are those with moderate flow. So this would be a deltaic environment, something low and slow flow, um, streams, slow moving streams, such like that. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, where we have our smallest clays and silts are going to be those with little to no flow, uh, such as lagoons, something very quiet, absolutely no waves, uh, any ripple or, or fast movement is caused by something moving through that water rather than the environment itself. We can see variations in energy of a depositional environment and the resulting deposited sediment uh, in very short distances. If we go out to a number of meandering rivers here in Michigan, meandering meaning that they move back and forth, it's not a straight line. Um, if you go to a curve of the river, you'll see uh, a cut bank and a point bar. We can look at the curve of the river in this image. So the part that is the inner curve is going to be the cut bank. This is where sediments are cut out and carried away. And then just on the opposite side of the river, there's actually deposition rather than erosion happening where we have a point bar. And water moves faster on this curve of the river than it does on the other curve. So this means that there's higher energy on this side, which allows us to cut away or pick up sediments, and then on the opposite side, it's much slower and lower energy, which is deposited. Uh, smaller sediments such as sand and, and clays. If you go and look at a river, you'll be able to see that one side of the river uh, on the outer bend will have the coarser grains like gravels, and those on the inner bend or point bar will have the finer grains. Rounding or sphericity is another diagnostic property of sedimentary rocks that you'll be using in lab. This describes the degree of rounding of the grains within the rock. Uh, back to the rock tumbler example, the longer it's in there, the more smooth it will be. And so the longer it's transported, the more smooth it will be. And this then can be indicative of the degree of weathering and erosion that a sample has undergone. To better understand this, we can think of yet another local example. You guys have probably probably been out to the sand dunes, maybe Van Buren or South Haven, or perhaps even Sleeping Bear Dunes. These are all beautiful sand dunes to visit in Michigan. Um, these are piles of sand, piled very high, that we can run down and glide down, and it's quite a smooth ride, and people love doing that. Um, and these dunes or hills of sand are held together by the small irregular irregularities in the spirosity or rounding of those sediments. So all of these grooves and cuts on the individual sand grains get caught on each other and that's what actually holds up that dune and allows it to pile so high. And when we step in it, the reason why we glide is because we're removing uh, the pressure that's holding those together or uh, unlocking those pieces that are pushed up into the grooves of one another, which allows us to to slide down the dunes with uh, as much fun as we're having. The individual grains become dislodged under the weight of your body and then can glide easily past each other. Now even though the grains of our dunes here in Michigan do have enough irregularity to be able to interlock with one another, they are fairly well-rounded grains, which is why uh, we have a lot of interest from other areas in mining our sand dunes to use them in the process of fracking. Um, it's very well-sorted sand, meaning that almost all of it is about the same grain size. It's another reason why it's so easy and smooth to glide down those dunes. Um, and this helps in the process of uh, injecting 
a liquid into a reservoir of some sort and those grains then holding apart uh, any fracks uh, or fractures that were induced by that process. And then when you can hold that space open, you can then reverse the process and extract uh, whatever's in the subsurface, oil, natural gas, whatever that resource they're seeking may be, rather than injecting something. But you need something to hold open those cracks that you're making in the first place. And one of the best things for that is a well-sorted natural sand made of quartz, because quartz has one of the, the higher hardness levels, so it's unlikely to break under the pressure of the, the overburn and weight of all the bedrock above wherever they're drilling to. There is a number of different depositional environments that we can have with sedimentary rocks. And this is something that you'll be investigating yourself in this week's assignment. You'll be looking into and looking up um, several different depositional environments. So just to give you a, a short introduction to some of those, if we look at the left-hand diagram here, we can see that meandering channel or meandering river that we talked about earlier with a point bar um, and a cut bank where the cut bank is the erosional portion and the point bar is the depositional portion. We can have a, a sandy braided river deposit as a result of a braided river. This is because of the relatively low energy of this system. However, movement of that water uh, braiding in and out with one another, the streams themselves. So we end up with uh, a horizontally variable deposit of finer sediments to, to coarser sediments. We can also have uh, deltas or floodplains. That's where things are being dumped in large portions from higher altitudes to lower altitudes. This is where we get a lot more grain size variation because everything in the way is being picked up and there's a lot of gravitational force and all of the rain and wind coming down that can pick up a lot of different sediment. Then we have our basins, whether that's central or oceanic. Um, those are our furthest out points or deepest points. That's where we get our most well-sorted uh, and well-rounded grains because they've had to travel the farthest. And a few other options here that you'll learn more about on your own. If we consider just the basin itself, generally speaking, we're talking about wave action. So uh, when you go to the beach, near the, nearest the shore is where the waves are most violent. If you swim out a little ways, it's not so choppy, right? So that means we have higher energy towards the shore and lower energy out towards the center of the, the ocean or the center of the lake, whatever we're considering. So we're going to have uh, larger sands and gravels here on the shallow end and fining more and more out to the upper slope or the, the deeper basin is what we would call it. Now we do have one exception to that general trend of finding with increase towards the center of the basin. And that's at the deep shelf here. Generally, we have at any basin a nearly flat shelf um, out to some distance and then a, a, a relatively steep drop off into the basin. And at the front of that shelf, or what we call the deep shelf, is where when we have storms, hurricanes, and so forth, that are picking up and energizing the, the water out here and carrying heavier sediment, it will collide with the shelf and end up dumping uh, coarser materials at this point. So that is our one exception to the general trend of, of course to fine here. Here's a figure that will help you guys out with your assignment this week. This is breaking down different depositional environments into as few words as possible to summarize and differentiate between them. You'll be doing something similar to this with a little bit more information to build yourself a study tool um, and to, to categorize these things in your mind. We can categorize these loosely into continental depositional environments, transitional environments, and marine environments. So transitional being the spot in between continental and marine where you may get uh, partially saline, partially freshwater depositional areas.
Continental is anything terrestrial. This includes lakes and streams. Transitional, again, anything in between or where the land meets the water. And the marine that starts at that top of the shelf where the waves hit the shore uh, and then all the way out into the deepest point of the basin. All right, we've gotten quite a ways into the lecture here, so now is actually a very good point for a brain break if you would like to pause the video and go ahead and take one for yourself. Getting back into it, we've got a few examples of sedimentary rocks to go through. You may see some of these in your next lab. So we can start with breccia, or uh, also called conglomerate. This is a cemented together a uh, very poorly sorted rock. We're going to have a range from clays all the way up to pebbles uh, with everything in between fine sand, coarse sand, silt, so on and so forth. Um, oftentimes this will compose of moderately rounded gravel. Uh, so while it is poorly sorted, it is often fairly well rounded. And this tells us a lot about the energy of the depositional environment in order for those to be fairly well rounded, but also carry those larger grains like pebbles and suspend a lot of other uh, sizes of sediment. It has to be a fairly high energy depositional environment. So we might be looking at something like uh, water rapids through a river or something like that. Sandstone is another very common sedimentary rock. This is uh, in contrast to breccia or conglomerate because it is in turn very well sorted. Uh, not all sands are very well sorted, but most are at least well sorted. Generally, they're going to be somewhere in the fine to medium grain range. A lot of them are majorly composed of quartz. Sometimes we'll get Arcos, which contains feldspar, if you guys remember looking at plagioclase feldspar. Uh, and then sometimes we'll have a gray wacky, which includes what we call lithics, um, which is like mud particles or clay. And these can be categorized based on their compositions as well, but we'll stay uh, with the generalized idea that most of them are primarily quartz in nature or in composition. Shale we talked about a bit earlier. Um, remember that this is formed in a very low energy environment, so we'll sometimes see these form at the bottom of lakes. River deltas and floodplains are very common for shales, and then occasionally on a deep ocean floor as well. So this would be very close to the center or deepest point of the basin where we get these because that is the lowest energy portion of the basin which means the finest sediments will settle out. And because shale is composed of the finest sediments, clay and silt size, primarily clay-sized grains, that's where we can expect to see it is in those low energy type environments. Siltstone is a step above shale. While shale is primarily clay-sized grains, siltstone is primarily silt-sized grains, so it's slightly larger than clay, if you recall. If you recall. Um, they're very similar, they have a very similar a formative environment. They often end up in the same places. It's just a matter of a slight increase in energy or a slight decrease in energy. Claystone is in the same grouping as shale and siltstone. Clay is a little bit finer than siltstone. If it doesn't qualify quite as a shale, then it's a claystone. Clay shale is a mixture of clay and silt, majorly clay. Claystone is if we have virtually no silt at all. And then mudstone is uh, like shale, but we may get some uh, a wider range of silt to clay with other grains mixed in. Some sand, uh, some massy, massive or blocky components, and uh, this is unlikely to exhibit that sort of layering pattern that we see in shale. Same thing with claystone, also unlikely to see that layering pattern. That's why it says non-fissile there. Carbonates are another type of sedimentary rock. This is a subclass of organic uh, sedimentary rocks. The carbonates are specifically those containing carbonate, which is one carbon atom to three oxygen atoms. 
This is uh, primarily limestone, which is mostly composed of calcite. We looked at calcite uh, in our minerals lab. It was one of the few that actually reacted to hydrochloric acid, and that's because it has carbonate in it, um, and the hydrochloric acid reacts with organic material uh, or carbon-based material, hence carbonate. Most are bio biochemical, but some of them can be inorganic. This just depends on the precipitation process. For all intents and purposes, we'll be focusing on the biochemical carbonates. Um, we'll be looking at some limestones in class, and these are often easily recognizable by the presence of fossils. That's where the organic material comes from within these rocks. It's uh, primarily plant, but can also be um, bacteria or um, fungi in rare instances. Chemical alteration of limestone uh, is somewhat common. If it is in the presence of a magnesium rich water, we can end up with a mineral called dolomite. And dolomite is a mineral that is commonly mined for its magnesium. It is a common constituent of refractory bricks as well as certain types of cement and fluxes for blast furnaces and a couple of other industrial processes. We can sometimes get chert nodules within limestone. This is a hard, compact, very fine grain silica-based rock. Um, nodules are like little sacks or little balls of um, the silica material that are distributed throughout the limestone, they are regularly shaped or rounded, um, so they can be little blobs or little um, balls ranging from a, less than a centimeter to up to a few centimeters. And you guys may have heard of jasper before. This is a, a red chert that we like to use in jewelry uh, or decorative purposes. And most of the time, chert is going to be a shade of brown, but it, depending on the degree of oxygenation and reduction or rusting, we can get that beautiful red color, and that gives us jasper. Uh, evaporites are a subcategory of the chemical sedimentary rocks. These are a result of the evaporation of saline waters, uh, either saline lakes or the ocean itself. And once all of that water evaporates out and we're left with salts, that can then cement and compact, which gives us rock salt or halite and gypsum. Gypsum is commonly used as a drywall component. So I doubt you all will forget what chert is now. Here's a, a table going through the classification of chemical sedimentary rocks. So. Um, there are more than just the salts. This can result from any precipitation where we have a growth of crystals that interlock. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, anyways, this nicely organizes chemical sedimentary rocks by both their texture and their composition. So we talked about and carbonates, those are those containing anything with the one carbon to three oxygens. So we have uh, calcite, which is part of that carbonate group. Quartz is silicate-based, so the chert is silicate-based. It's um, Si1 silicon to two oxygen. Gypsum, that's dissolved salt in water. Uh, halite is another salt dissolved in water, and then we can also have altered plant fragments, um, which gives us something like coal. So this is going to be something that's also useful to you in lab. Um, fine to coarse grain, visible shells or shells, that's something that you might see uh, in calcite or other carbonates if it's a coquina, which we can see an example of here, where you can actually see the shells held in place of this because they've been compacted together. So coquina is actually a type of limestone. This, all of these organic base shell are, shells are held together by other organic particles or precipitates. 
Chalk is also a type of limestone. Specifically, it's a very fine grain, soft limestone. This is one that's made primarily of ground up white shells uh, and platonic, uh, planktonic organisms called coccoliths. Once more, uh, organic rocks are where we see our natural resources as oil and natural gas. Uh, these are secretions of the organic material from those organic rocks, and that oil is mainly plant-based and can be converted into natural gas with enough heat and pressure. Um, this typically will accumulate in the porous overlying rocks as it becomes, uh, as it secretes or becomes almost cooked into natural gas. That's going to change the density so they'll rise and eventually they'll get trapped in the pore spaces of a more porous rock such as the sandstone and are often prevented from moving further to the surface by a less permeable or a, a rock with less pore space such as shale overlying that porous rock like sandstone in this example. Both coal and oil are very dark in coloration, either very dark brown to black, uh, because they formed in environments lacking oxygen. Not that they were, it was completely absent, but very, very low levels of oxygen. The presence of oxygen is what uh, allows rusting or oxidation to take place. Um, if there is oxygen, then we'll see uh, some red coloration. If there's a lack of oxygen, uh, it's indicative of an anoxic environment, meaning a, a low oxygen environment. So this can tell us uh, about the environment that this rock formed in because we can make the, the inference that there is low oxygen levels. Um, this isn't just present in coal and oil, but in other formations as well. We can see in uh, what are called banded iron formations a switch between uh, layers of black and red, where through time there were periods in Earth's history where there was more oxygen and less oxygen, switching back and forth between two main levels, um, which are recorded in that rock. So in any of these cases where we're talking about classifying or identifying uh, sedimentary rocks, it's all about texture, be it the grain size, the rounding, the uh, crystalline or plastic texture, how much pore space there is, so on and so forth. Can you see shells um, and whatever you might, whatever else might be present? So when we're looking at the samples in lab, you're going to have a table similar to this one here, where you're going to want to start with the question of, is it plastic or is it crystalline? And you can move forward from there by looking at the grain size, Maybe you'll be able to identify some of the composition. Most of you have a good idea of what quartz looks like. It's that transparent, um, you know, clear, maybe a little bit foggy, um, so translucent, little grains within it that's going to be harder than, than generally anything else uh, that you're looking at. And so this can help you sort of deduce what type of rock you might be looking at and you'll probably get to a point where you're between two options that are similar such as siltstone and shale at which point um, you're going to be looking for characteristics like that lamination or that layering that that uh sort of stacking behavior between them and as always i'm around to help so in the next part of this lecture, we'll get into metamorphic rocks, and I'll see you guys then.